This is Jeremy Clark of JeremyBytes.com, and we're going to talk a little bit more about Lambda expressions today. Specifically, how we can use captured variables with for loops. In part one of the series, we looked at captured variables, and one important feature is the value of the variable is the value at the time that it's used, not the value at the time that it's captured. Now normally this isn't a problem, but there is one situation where we can get into trouble, and that's if we try to capture the indexer of a for loop. So today we'll look at a little bit of code to see that problem, and we'll see a very simple solution. Here in Visual Studio, you'll notice that we have a new bonus folder in our solution. If you download the code from GitHub, you will see this, and we'll be looking at the Captured Variables project today. Now this is just a console application, and we see that we have some pretty simple code so far. Right now, all we're doing is calling the getPeople method on our people object in order to get a list of person. If we click into this class, we see that it is pretty simple. In fact, our getPeople method is just returning a hard-coded collection of person objects. Now, if we look at the person class, this will look similar to the person objects we've been dealing with so far, but this does have an additional property, an ID field. This will give us a primary key that we can deal with, and more importantly, when we output these items to the screen, the ID property will make it really easy to distinguish our items. So if we go back to our program, we'll see we have an output person method. This is a pretty simple method that just takes a list of person and an integer, and it just uses that integer to index into the list and call the toString method on the selected item. Now the example that we have here is a bit contrived, but it will get our point across when we're using captured variables with for loops. So let's go ahead and create a method that will call this output person method. So for this, I'm just gonna create a private static method that will return void, and we're going to call this bad capture since this is where we're going to start off. Now this will take a list of person as a parameter and we'll call this people. And what we'll do inside here is use a for loop. Now I love code snippets, so I'm just gonna type for and hit tab twice and we'll see Visual Studio has stubbed this out for us. I'm gonna tab over to the length and for the length of this, we're gonna say people.count. So this will be the number of items that are in our list and we're saying less than count since we have a zero based indexer. Now we want to show capturing this indexer, the I. So I'm going to say task.run, and then inside here we want an action. Now an action is simply a delegate, and in this case it will take no parameters and return void. As we saw earlier, we can create a lambda expression with no parameters by just putting some empty parentheses, and then we'll add the goes to operator, and then we're going to call our output person method. Now for this, we do have two parameters, so we'll use people for our list, and for the indexer, we'll use i. And what we're doing in this case is we're capturing two variables inside our Lambda expression. We're capturing people, which is a parameter that's coming into our bad capture method, and we're also capturing i, the indexer of our for loop. Now what I would expect is to get an incremental list of all of the items in this people collection. But as we'll see, that's not exactly what we'll get. So we'll call bad capture up here and we'll pass in the people collection. And then let's just go ahead and run our application. Now, as you can see, we got a runtime exception and it's an argument out of range exception. And we can see that the message says index was out of range, must be non-negative and less than the size of the collection. Now this seems very strange. So let's go ahead and put in a little bit of error handling so that we can see what value we're actually getting out for index. Now, like I said, I love code snippets and there's also this really cool keyboard shortcut. So in this case, I'm going to highlight the one line we have. I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut Control K, Control S, which is surround with, and then I'm going to type in the try snippet. Now, if I hit tab, Notice that it just surrounded the line that I highlighted in a try catch block. I really love this because I like to have Visual Studio do as much of the work for me as possible. Now the exception that we're looking for is an argument out of range exception. So let's go ahead and choose that. And then we'll just do a console.write line to uh, output a message that we can see. So we'll just say argument out of range. And then we'll put in our actual value. And then we don't want to rethrow this exception. We just want to go ahead and handle this here. Now let's run our application again. And this shows us what our problem is. 
notice that the actual value of the indexer that we captured is seven. And also notice that it's the same for all seven calls of this method. And that's something that we don't expect by just looking at this code. When we capture the indexer, we would expect that it would have different values for each call to output person. But as we can see, it's all the same. And that's because the value of the captured variable is the value at the time it's used, not the value at the time it's captured. So by the time it's used, this for loop has completed, which means the value of i is people.count, which happens to be seven since we have seven items in our collection, but that's out of range since we have a zero-based indexer on our list. So this is the problem, and you might say, well, how do I get around this? It's actually a pretty easy solution. But before I get there, I wanna do a little bit of housekeeping. Since we're using tasks, I want to make sure that all of the tasks have completed running before I go on to the next step. So for this, I'm going to create a local variable called tasks, and this is going to be an array of task items, and this is going to be the same size as our collection. Now, the reason I have this is I want to save off each of these tasks. If we look at task.run, notice that it returns a task. So let's go ahead and save a copy of this. So we'll just say tasks i equals task.run, and this will save off that particular task that we just created. Now we don't have to worry about the indexer in this case because we're not capturing it, we're just using it. And at the very bottom of this method, I'm just going to use the wait all method on the task object, and this will wait until all of the tasks in our local array have completed before this method continues executing. And if we run the application, we'll see we get exactly the same output that we had before at this point. So let's go ahead and create a method that captures the variables correctly. So for this, we'll just say private static void. We'll call this one good capture. And this will also take a list of person. And this will also have a for loop. So again, we'll just use our snippets and we'll say people.count for the length. Now what I'm going to do inside my for loop is create a local variable called captured index. And this will just be set to i, the indexer that's coming from our for loop. And then this is the actual value that we'll capture in our Lambda expression. So we'll say task.run, we'll use our empty parentheses, goes to output person, and we'll say people and captured index. Now the difference here is we're not capturing i, the indexer from the for loop. Instead, we're capturing this captured index variable. This is a local variable that's scoped for a single iteration of this for loop. So what this means is each time through the for loop, we create a new captured index variable, and then our Lambda expression captures that one item. So we end up with seven different variables, and each of these will have the value we expect since we're not changing the value after we set it. So now let's call this method. And again, this is called good capture. So now if we run our application, we get the output that we expect. So we do see our different values, but notice they're in no particular order. So we have two, five, one, seven, three, six, four. And if we run our application again, we'll see that they come out in a different order. That's just because of the way the scheduler works when we're dealing with tasks. Now, like we did before, I'm going to go ahead and just add a little bit of housekeeping code so that these two methods look the same. So we'll create a variable called tasks and we'll set this to a new array. And then each time through the loop, we'll make sure that we go ahead and save off the task that we're creating. And then at the bottom of the method, we'll make sure that we wait for everything to finish before we continue. And when we say wait all, it just makes sure that when we're doing our output, all of our bad values are grouped together and all of our good values are grouped together. So just to review, when we capture a variable, the value is the value at the time it's used, not the value at the time that it's captured. In most situations, we don't run into a problem, but if we do try to capture the indexer of a for loop, will end up with the final value of that indexer and not the intermediate values that we're expecting. But there is an easy solution to this. All we need to do is create a variable that's local to that iteration and save off the value of the indexer. The result is that instead of capturing a single variable, we're actually capturing seven different variables and each of those has the value that we expect because the value doesn't change after we capture it.
So as we've seen, captured variables and for loops don't go very well together. If we're not paying attention, we might get values that we don't expect. But as we've seen, there is a very easy solution to the problem. All we need to do is keep in mind that the value of a captured variable is the value at the time it's used, not the value at the time it's captured. To get more information and links to the code on GitHub, just follow the links for this video or visit www.jeremybytes.com where you'll find links to this and other videos in the series. Thanks for joining me and we'll see you next time.